We've discussed very briefly five major different types of hormones. They're given to you here on this figure in case you need to refer to spellings. Our first focus today will be on auxins. Auxins is a, are a chemical group that is released from the apical meristem or apical buds of a plant. We've talked about apical buds before when we talked about primary plant growth. Do you remember where the apical bud is? The hint I have here for you is that the apical or auxin hormone moves down the plant. So where must it be located? Right. IAA or idole acetic acid or auxin promotes elongation of the primary growth in the plant. It's located at the top of the plant in the apical bud and causes the plant to get taller. Now, if we're going to deal with this sort of hormone and the constant increasing length of the shoot, the plant getting taller, we also are going to have to keep in mind we need a counter to this or the elongation of roots to make sure the plant has enough nutrients to grow. So consider this figure for a moment. On our x-axis we have increasing auxin concentration. Auxin is the group of hormones, IAA is a specific one that we see and that is easily isolated. IAA is a hormone that many people will actually use on house plants and garden plants to help increase in speed growth. So we have an increasing auxin concentration from left to right. Keep in mind the minus 8, minus 6, minus 4, minus 2, that's increasing concentration because our numbers are getting larger, right? Okay, so 10 to the minus 8 this is a very small number. 10 to the minus 2 means you have two decimal points um, to the two numbers to the right of your decimal point. 1 of course being our whole number. 10 to the 2 remember is just 100. So when we look at this figure we have this increasing concentration in grams per liter of auxin but what we also want to look at is the fact that we have kind of two scales on the on the y-axis for us. We have promotion and inhibition suggesting that if you have the perfect concentration of auxin, in this case in our root line here, we're actually looking at about 10 to the minus 7th grams per liter is a perfect concentration to promote root growth. How do I know that? And how do I know that if I go beyond that, I actually go into inhibition about 10 to the minus 5? I have actually started to inhibit growth and if I get down, to, if I increase that concentration to 10 to the minus 4, I actually have significant inhibition of the roots. Similar patterns in my stems, again coming up and I've got good promotion of stem elongation at about 10 to the minus 2, but they've marked here for you 0.9 grams per liter actually causes a turnover of stem promotion to stem inhibition. How do I know that? We look for the peaks on our graph. Okay, When we see the highest peaks here, we're looking for the most promotion or the greatest elongation of our roots and our stems. But if we look as we go beyond that and our curves start to fall off, we go into this inhibition zone at the bottom. So we've actually added so much auxin in this case that we have inhibited growth. And we're going to show you why. Hormones work in very small amounts, trace amounts, in your body, in a plant system, whatever. When we get high concentrations of some of these hormones, they are chemicals. They will become toxic to the plant. The other thing we have to consider is many of these hormones are not working alone. Okay, They're working as a pair and what we look at as the pair for auxin is known as cytokinin. 
Okay, so cytokinin is actually promoting cell division, but what we're looking for in this case is a movement from not from the top to bottom as with auxin, but from the bottom to top. You see I have here for you that it's actually moving up from the roots. Cytokinins are produced in the roots. So what we're looking for is a way to keep the bottom of the plant growing while the top of the plant is, is trying to get taller. So these are what we call antagonistic hormones. Auxin wants the plant to get taller. Cytokinins actually want the plant to get wider. Why would you want your plant to be wide at the bottom? Where is the sunlight coming from? Remember, plants are constantly competing for sunlight. So if we go back to our oxen figure here just for a moment, we see these kind of triangular shaped trees. The oxen is working at the peaks of these trees to help them grow taller. The cytokinins are working at the bottom to help them become wider. What does that do for availability of sunlight to our plant? Gibberellins are another type of hormone that we look at. Again, working on cell elongation, cell division, you see these first couple are very much focused on cell growth and cell division um, and cell elongation. Remember in plants, we saw it particularly in the in the roots with the zone of elongation, the the cells divide very, very quickly. And then we go into a phase where the cells will just elongate. They're not becoming more numerous, they're just getting longer so that those roots can get longer. Gibberellins, again, working on cell elongation and cell division, this time in stems and leaves. And what we look at with our, with our gibberellin is actually helping those stems and leaves to become longer and longer and longer and also helping to promote fruit development and seed germination. So gibberellins are often applied to agricultural crops to help develop better fruits. So I show you a picture here of two different types of plants. This dwarf plant has been untreated with gibberellin, but this other one has been treated with gibberellins and it's very, very tall almost kind of lanky you see and you might think that this is a very unhealthy plant because it's so tall it's missing leaves at the bottom but where are those leaves? Well they're all at the top right? Where's the sunlight? All at the top. So for this plant not having leaves at the bottom is not important right? Here's the effect of gibberellin on fruit. If we look at the gibberellin um, application, the fruit, this, the grape clusters here on the left have been treated with gibberellin. The ones on the right have been untreated. You see how small the ones on the right are compared to the ones on the left. Okay, so think about from a market standpoint. If you're buying grapes in the grocery store, most people will look primarily for these large grapes assuming that they're going to be full of more sugary kind of sweetness associated with them. Turns out that just by increasing the size of the grapes does not necessarily increase the sweetness. Try it the next time you have a bunch of grapes. The small ones tend to be much sweeter than the large ones, but consumers prefer larger fruit and so they're willing um, in many cases uh, to go for these grapes that would be on the left, but now you know the grapes on the right would actually be the sweeter grapes for us. ABA actually helps us with, with germination and inhibits growth. So this is the first hormone that we see that actually is going to inhibit growth for us. We talk about ABA as being a stress hormone because what ABA's primary role is is to stop uh, germination. So ABA and gibberellin are going to work together. Again, these are a set of antagonistic hormones. Gibberellin says germinate and grow. ABA says no, don't germinate. We've talked before about we have to have particular environmental signals to have a plant actually germinate or a seed actually germinate. What were those environmental signals? We've probably talked about temperature, water, length of day, 
right? The longer the sun is out, the warmer the soils become. The seed heats up and it will want to germinate. Well, it turns out that ABA is present in very, very high concentrations and the plant will actually have to counter that with high levels of gibberellin in order for the plant to actually germinate from the seed. So what we look at is a ratio always of these antagonistic hormones. So the amount of ABA compared to the amount of gibberellin will actually control when a seed germinates. Ethylene may be the only hormone out of these that you have heard of. Ethylene is associated with the ripening of fruits, but it's also associated with uh, the dropping of leaves in the fall in deciduous trees. It's associated with the rotting of leaves to provide nutrients to the plant. So when we see ethylene like this, we're associating it here perhaps with something very negative. It causes our bananas to brown. But in many cases, this browning of the fruit may be negative for us, but keep in mind you are not the ultimate seed disperser, right? We talked about this in a previous video. The idea that you do not distribute seeds well. So if a plant is going to ripen a fruit like this, why is it ripening the fruit? Smell a ripe peach or nectarine compared to one that is green. It attracts you to it, right? That sweet scent. Well, imagine that you're a plant in the middle of the woods, a tree in the middle of the woods, trying to attract a seed disperser. You need to produce that high level of, of sweet and attractive aromas to bring in seed dispersers to eat your fruit and carry your seeds to a new location so they can germinate. Beyond that, even if you aren't attracting seed dispersers, with this rotting of the fruit, advanced ripening, those, those fruit will fall to the ground with the seeds inside, and the rotting of the fruit will actually provide nutrients to that, to that seed and to the future plant, not to the seed itself, but when that seed germinates, the soils around it are now very fertile with that rotting, with that rotting fruit.